oh boy do we have some big Mandalorian news today. We have a few tidbits to go through but first of all, some exclusive footage posted to the App Store, which should be available soon on the official Star Wars YouTube account, our first official look at Season 3, an entire scene that takes place on Navarro. If you remember guys, prior to Season 2, we had a glimpse of Cobb Vance Bar on Mos Pelgo, while this clip is also believed to be from the first episode of Season 3, so Chapter 17. It's got Grief Karger at his office, Din Djarin and Grogu. It's very clear that Grief wants Din to stay, but he tells him he can't, he's got to go to Mandalore, he calls himself an apostate who needs to be redeemed for his sin of removing his helmet. All the while, Grogu is adorably spinning in his chair, interested in the candy-looking things on the marshal's desk. Grief is confused, he thought Mando completed his journey to return Grogu to the Jedi, and yet, he's still with the child. Of course, as we know in the Book of Boba Fett, Grogu rejected Luke's training and returned to Mando, which brings us on to our next subject, some new comments by John Favreau. But that was basically the clip guys, nothing too interesting, but it's really cool to get our first look at the third season. Mando season 3 is just around the corner, and there is something that ever since the Book of Boba Fett aired, fans have been wondering about, why did Din and Grogu reunite so soon? For the last year in fan spaces, I've seen this conversation come up time and time again, some fans saying it doesn't matter, and others saying it spoiled the Mandalorian for them. And for those fans who just watched the Mandalorian and didn't see the Book of Boba Fett, they're going to be very confused when season 3 starts, although they will probably give us a recap beforehand. Now when it comes to this reunion, it was always in the cards. In a big way, as Favreau says, the Mandalorian is a retelling of Paper Moon, where the child returns to the adoptive adult. While John Favreau just addressed this in Empire Magazine, here's what he said. We just couldn't hit a hard reset. It's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds for people who didn't see The Book of Boba, but I think the show, and he's referring to The Book of Boba Fett, offered some time to pass. He says, You saw what Mando was like without Grogu, and we saw what Grogu was like without Mando, and neither of them were doing too good, so them coming back together was a really good plot point that allows us to jump back into Season 3 while maintaining their central relationship. And by the sounds of things, guys, it doesn't sound as though John and Dave ever planned for Grogu and Din to be apart for too long. They were always destined to reunite, and I think from a marketing standpoint, that makes a lot of sense, the financial gain of bringing Grogu into it was huge. Let's be real, Grogu sells toys, so they saw the Book of Boba Fett as the perfect opportunity for the reunion. Even if it was admittedly a little bit strange that all the stuff with Grogu, Din, Ahsoka, Luke took place in the Book of Boba Fett, was it the wrong show for it? Because we ended up with two and a half episodes that were essentially the Mandalorian 2.5. But you know what? The irony is, and this is just my point of view, those episodes were some of the best of the entire show. I've said it before, but episode 6, From the Desert Comes a Stranger, is one of my all-time favourite Star Wars episodes of anything. And what I find really fascinating is I bought the book of Boba Fett novelization, the young novel by Joe Schreiber, and I found the book has made me appreciate the show so much more. A lot of fans criticise John Favreau's writing, but I found that when it's laid out from start to finish like in the book, you tend to see what they were going for a lot better, even if you disagree. John Favreau goes on to say, I think you have to service both things, and he's referring to Grogu's path. The question of does he belong with Mando, or should he become a Jedi, is that his path? and as some folks pointed out, Grogu's gonna live so long, he could literally live the equivalent of multiple lifetimes, multiple paths, so right now he's a foundling under Din, but in the future he might decide to become a Jedi again. That's the beauty of being a Yoda species, but the downside, you outlive your human friends and those who are not Yoda species, which is gonna be so sad when Din Jaren dies, that's gonna happen eventually. If we do get an Endgame style Mandalorian film, it could take place then, they're not gonna kill Din Jaren off in this show, but in the context of the universe, in the the story, that is something Grogu is going to have to face. I think along with Omega and Ahsoka, Grogu is part of the future of this franchise, not just in The Mandalorian, but also future shows and films. And John was asked about this, he gave something of a non-answer, he said quote, there's always an opportunity when you have a set of characters and stories that people connect with, that you could cross media into different eras. Marvel does it quite effectively, it's just a matter of where our time should be spent and what the appetite of the audience is, with all these stories we're telling, it's definitely a full-time job just keeping this going, and what we're doing now, television has a much different rhythm and schedule than film does, really awesome stuff. And so now guys, let's look at more of my interview with Paul Soon Hung Lee. Here is a segment of his experience on set for The Mandalorian, enjoy. Yeah, that's, those are great questions. Um, my first day on set was, I mean, wow, I, I felt, I mean, I've used this term before, I felt like Cinderella at the ball. It's like, I don't belong here, but here I am. And uh, I think I, I must have cried at least three or four times. 
that day. Um, I, I cried during my wardrobe fitting. Uh, you know, I cried sort of walking around the set. I got misty eyed and whatnot. Um, it, it was an emotional time. Just sort of being there and looking on in awe and kind of going, wow, this is, it's real. It's really happening. Um, my first day, uh, I, I didn't actually shoot. I went in for my wardrobe fitting. And then after that was done, I had a good cry about putting on the X-Wing costume and wearing the helmet. Uh, there was a call on the radio and they, they said, well, JF wants to talk to him. I was like, Who's JF? J- oh, John Favreau. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally normal. Um, so we drove the set. And, you know, it's all under security and whatnot. And I go through and I'm watching Carl Weathers direct a scene and John's there. And uh, he comes over and he's very, he's, he's tall. He's so tall, like taller than you expect. I mean, I thought he was going to be tall and big to begin with, but he's just like, I felt like a giant. And I was just looking up at him and I adore this man's work. I adore him himself. Uh, he's a nerd as well. Um, when I was in university, uh, one of the movies, his sort of signature calling card movie was one called Swingers that was directed by Doug Lyman. And he had written it and starred in it and uh, introduced the world to like other actors like Vince Vaughn, uh, Ron Livingston, uh, and himself, obviously. And, uh, and Heather Graham was in it. And it was one of those things where that movie was like really spoke to me at the time because I was like going through a kind of a breakup myself like a long-term relationship breakup. So anyways, huge fan of his work. And there he is standing in front of me. He says, hey, let, let me show you around. Let me show you around. And he took me on a guided tour of all the sets for season two. And uh, season one hadn't aired yet on on tel- So I had no idea how any of this, <laughs> the context of any of these sets. Um, and at the end of it, he said, you know, I, I wanted to show you around because I know for a lot of, a lot of actors who are fans, it's... It can be overwhelming, and I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of an ass peek so you weren't so overwhelmed when you're shooting, so you can concentrate on the work. And I thought that is so that's super dope. First of all, like thank you, he's so considerate, so generous of him to do that. And uh, he was right because e- even on the second day, you still look around. <laughs> I was still like overwhelmed by a lot of it. Going, wow, look at this! Oh, look at that! Look at those! And as a nerd, like a Star Wars nerd. It's just like, I swear to God, I thought I was going to have a nosebleed because it was holding in so much of my, you know, you got to be professional. You're there to work. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was that was my first day. He gave me a coin. He gave me a challenge coin, which was amazing. And it was all, it had the Mandalorian script on it. And I rushed home uh, back to the hotel room and I, I translated it and it said, this is the way. And I thought, oh, I have no idea what that means, but that's super cool. Uh, so I still, I actually lost that coin, but I got a replacement coin from it. Um, but the first day of shooting, too, was just like, and then there's Carl Weathers, Hollywood royalty. Uh, I remember watching him in Rocky movies, right? Apollo Creed, uh, in Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Action Jackson, of course. Um, and and uh, he was also in, like, Happy Gilmore. So, like, the man has an incredible amount of rage, range, rage. Um, you know, he's, a, he's an action star. He's a comedian super intelligent and he's a great director too and so like working with him was just like yikes it, it was and that was the first my first gig in america i'd only ever worked in canada so that was my oh. first job was in the united states on a star wars show being directed by carl weathers like i i thought i died and gone to heaven to be honest i i was done <laughs> it's just like That's yep. amazing so, so I, I do have a question. We know that Carl Weathers has directed in season three. Did you mm-hmm. get to work with him again in the new season? Uh, I did not. Not in the third season. But uh, he was, I, we ran into him on set, which was great. And what I loved was, so the first time I worked with him, he didn't know who I was, obviously. He was just like, and he didn't cast me. That was the other thing. I'd been cast by John Favreau and, and Dave Filoni. It was, I didn't have to audition for it. They reached out and said, hey. Would he be available? Does he want to read for this part, Carson Teva? And I had no idea who the character, like I was like, uh, they use a code name and the code name was Foodie Pilot. Foodie Pilot number one. And um, I didn't know, I mean, this is how naive I am. Like in Canada, we don't have code names. We just have character names, right? And so for a show like The Mandalorian, where they're obviously trying to limit spoilers, they have code names for everything, right? So it's like, oh, okay. 
So Foodie Pilot was just a code name, but I took it literally and I thought, Foodie Pilot? So like, is this a guy that flies like a space diner? Like, is it like one of those space trucks where they serve food out the back? I was like, I don't care. I will take it. I will be in Star Wars and I will die a happy man. I will be thankful for whatever they give me. Um, and then later on, I learned, I got a phone call from from uh, John and Dave and they explained who Carson Tava was. I thought, oh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Like he's a pilot for for the, the New Republic and he, he used to be with the Rebellion. I thought, oh, this is so cool. And then, you know, they said I was going to be able to show my face. Like I wasn't going to have like all these prosthetics or latex on, which I thought I was going to be. I thought I was going to have like 15 pounds of makeup on and no one was going to be able to see my face. But so that really sort of amped it up for me. 